How's everybody doing this evening? Good. I can't see you because the lights are out, but you know, we're going to do the best we can with that. So, um, on a serious note, uh, so the piece, um, this piece was commissioned by um, Chamber of Music America in relationship to um, Frederick Douglass. Everybody here knows the name of Frederick Douglass, right? But do you really know, do you really know Frederick Douglass? That's the whole point. <coughs> Did you know he was a slave that escaped to freedom? Everybody knows that, right? He was pretty much the first equivalent to uh, what we would call a civil rights leader in terms of Martin Luther King because he was the first intellectual um, preacher coming out of slavery. He taught himself how to read. He tricked his slavery mates into helping them learn how to read. He was one of the only people that beat one of his masters and lived to tell about it and walked around proud of it. <laughs> so he was an interesting kind of cat. He was kind of Facebook and Instagram before that because uh, he was the most um, pictured person, photographed person in the world during his day. That's where you always saw that hairstyle and spit down the side and all that kind of stuff. He was a dapper dresser. The house that he bought in D.C., so we had to do some research. I did some research. I went to his house in D.C. Uh, and you, if you go to his house, you have to walk up the walk up. And it was the first house with indoor toilet and washing facilities and all that kind of stuff. So it was modern for his time. But if you get to his house, <coughs> and you know, Southeast D.C. historically is the black part of town. But he had to send the money back to him while he was away um, preaching at abolitionism. Uh, he would send his money home to his wife, and his wife kept his money. And they had to get a white man to buy this house in Southeast because it's set way up on the hill. So when you go to his house, it's almost like, you know, nothing in D.C. is higher than the Washington Monument and all that stuff. It's almost you looking across and kind of down at the Washington <laughs> Monument, you know, so they said he had to have this kind of house because he um, always had students from Howard. He always had, he had presidents, he had senators, congressmen come to his house, so he had to have an impressive kind of situation. So he was just a phenomenal guy for during his time and what he did and what he accomplished. I think he was a uh, uh, counsel to like four presidents or something like that, you know. He got on, he addressed, he got on Lincoln's case to make Lincoln abolish slavery because Lincoln wasn't going to abolish slavery. So he would always talk about Lincoln to his face <laughs> to tell him to abolish slavery. So, and at the first anniversary, I think, of Lincoln's death, he did a big speech on Lincoln and he really went in on Lincoln. You know, if you really lead, read the dialogue of the speech. So for him, he knew John Brown. <laughs> he knew all those kind of guys. So he was friends with John Brown. And he had another guy that was his enemy. So I'm just saying that he knew all the uh, different people in relationship to what was going on in African American society during that particular time. So this is the piece that's uh, dedicated to Frederick Douglass, redefining. Frederick Douglass. Preacher, here to share with you an account of an observer. 
forever over the ages hear me now as I bestow upon you the truth as I best know it. The greater man to play the fire igniter, phenomenal writer, the builder of revolutionary thoughts, the freedom fighter, the narrator, agitator, orator, troublemaker, the moral compass of America's broken true north, the compass of truth, freedom, and justice. <laughs> white man of the South, scornfully denominated by the rich slaveholders as poor white trash, so long deceived, misled, and plundered by the slaveholding aristocracy, are to be delivered from their political and social debasement. The toil-worn, scarred, maimed, and battered veterans of all nationalities and all colors now returning home from the scenes of strife are to be welcomed home and taught by the respect and gratitude they receive from their country that they have been fighting for their country and not merely for the empty and delusive hope of a country. <laughs> What makes a man a slave? What force holds them bound and afraid? Forced to performance, to labor, to judge, and create a sense of obligation to use the majority of their energy to enrich another with little benefit to themselves, their family and community at the expense of their everything. How? Strong is that last, and the hand that wills it, that compels the diminished being to pain themselves for the comfort and convenience of a would-be oppressor, who would go through extreme lengths to build a system around their evil and use every tool of religion, politics, science to justify their actions and their right to do so. That last. Slavery will not touch. And where we propaganda. Slavery will not touch. Of intentional be cognitive dissonance from capitalistic compilations that convince the slave that is better for them me. here slavery on this plantation in that unknown world outside of its own brutal me. sanctuary. Slavery will that not last slight me. One. With fury and we will not Swung take the life intent. out of me. Swung with centuries Slavery of practice, privilege, and succession. Me. Skillful strokes made to draw blood from each swing. The Rain flesh out of from me. bone and I rob the whip of their free will. Their sense of self, their sense of community, and a desire for a better life. To and leave them. He Leave them I am home. not a man Hope to my kinsmen you, that it will get I better faith man my sisters and brothers you, to these hard you times will pass define and grow me with be better you ever understand me you will not define me will you ever understand Slavery will not 
touch me. Slavery will not
First thing, the historians like to tell you about Mrs. Anna Douglas is that she was illiterate. Married to one of the world's greatest writers and orators, Mrs. Douglas could barely read. The second thing they like to point out is how she tolerated her husband's alleged infidelity. How during the course of their lives together, her internationally famous husband moved in two of his supposed inamoratas to Mrs. Douglas's chagrin. Far less mention than the above two points is one of the most important parts of her character. Mama Anna Murray Douglas didn't give a damn about what you all thought about her. Mama Anna was one of those rarities in the human experience that knew her worth, knew her strength, and knew her lane. And those who would frown upon her were those who really couldn't say the same. So whatever else you want to say about her, put some respect on her name. Anna Murray Douglas is the underlying why for of why we can even speak the name of Frederick Douglas to this day. She was the engine under his hood, the turbine that kept this powerhouse of a man running. The reason he could even run it all from back when he was merely a fugitive runaway to running their household's finances to keep them from financial ruin. A 44-year veteran of a war that had no chance of being won without her there as a day one. Put some respect on her name. It's a shame that Langs would try to define fame her work. Crane their necks to look back at her with disrespect as if she didn't affect every aspect of the important work that Baba Fred would come to do. She made his improbable escape possible, hatched the caper with her own resources and paper, just so the man she loved could taste what freedom she already knew. Because she eschewed the limelight to help of her helpmate made her no less great. Her inability to read didn't prevent her from planting, nurturing, and harvesting the seeds sown in her family as she gave birth to and raised five educated offspring while overseeing her home as a station for escaping victims of America's inhumane slavery system. The bravery, endurance, 
and fortitude she exhibited to the day she passed made her an invaluable asset to the movement. She moved with intent, the same as her husband, both sacrificing their own egress from static to ensure that their people could live emphatically free from the bonds of chattel slavery. Mama Anna was the catalyst, how dare anybody look down at her, whether it be some 19th century Karen like Jezebel's or revisionist historians who want the story to be what they want it to be, using smidgens of the truth to fortify their lives. This woman, this woman who should never be considered working behind him, stayed beside him, even as he left her behind for months, even years at a time, to raise the children, stabilize their station, and financially support their operation on her own. Were there issues? Of course, they were wrong. But she alone defined her strong, even as they tried to play her for some weak dame. She made this movement possible, so put some respect on her name. Mama, Anna, Murray, Douglas. Mama, Anna, Murray, Douglas. Mama, Anna, Murray, Douglas. Mama, Anna, Murray, Douglas. Come on, Mama, Anna, Murray, Douglas. Mama, Mama, Anna, Anna, Murray, Douglas. Mama, Mama, Anna, Anna, Murray, Murray, Douglas, Douglas. Mama, Mama, Anna, Anna, Murray, Murray, Douglas, Douglas. Mama, Anna.
what do we do? Today, how do we erase this blighted past away? Not in a way that we forget what has been done, but in a manner that we do not repeat the mistakes of our past and create a future for our people and planet that will last. A present where this present system collapses in on itself so we can reveal from scratch instead of patching up holes in this wall of mess that was destined to fall from its felonious, murderous onset. How do we get past the fear? The fear of what they say, of what they'll do. The fear that you are not capable to do what must be done and shy away from the greatness that has always been in you. Today we no longer feel alone. The day we lose fear is the day we are emancipated. No matter the temporary condition we find ourselves in here. You cannot enslave that which does not fear. And if in the coming reconstruction, we shall incorporate any of the seeds of injustice, any of the remains of slavery. We shall repeat the mistakes of our fathers with the certainty that our children after us will reap a similar harvest of blood to that we have just experienced. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. You cannot enslave that which does not fear. You cannot enslave that which does not fear. So this is our presentation of Frederick Douglass. Be defined in Frederick Douglass. On trombone, let's give it up for Mr. Steve Berry on trombone. <laughs> the oldest one in the group, let's give it up for Kevin King on tenor, y'all. When I was 22, I didn't know what to do. Let's give it up for him on oboe, flute, clarinet, and tenor saxophone. Let's give it up for him, y'all. Come on now. The one, the only, Mr. Corey Wilkes. Corey Wilkes on trumpet, y'all. Get up for him. Ben Lamar Gay on cornet. Give it up for him. So I'm gonna have to tell some stories, so. When we first started this, we had another poet, vocalist. And um, it just didn't work out. So at the last minute, like, what, it was about two or three weeks before Kahari? 
I had to go back on Kahari. I'm like, damn, I hate to do this to you, Kahari, but I got to. Please, please, please. I begged him. So I gave him that big book. What's that book by Frederick Douglass, the new one? I don't know. It's, it's 800 pages. Right? It's like know. this big, thick book of Frederick, the new one. I said, well, look, man, you got to do your homework and come up with some pros. Then this cat came up with a book. He came up with a book. I'm like, we got to cut all that stuff. So we, we cut a lot of it tonight in terms of what the pros was related to, what he interpreted out of the book and his research. But let's get it up for the one, the only, the disco poet, Mr. Kahari Bowden, y'all. She the behind the scenes boss. You know what I liked about her? I had her in the Young Masters and she came to me. She said, Dawkins, I don't want the gig because I'm a woman. I want the gig because I can play good and I'm a woman. I said, my girl, shit. Alexis Lombre, y'all, <laughs> give it up for her. I said, that's my girl, there you go. Let me hear some banjo, man. Come on, let me hear some, play some. Way down, the Let's give it up for the one and only Will Faber on banjos. And the man on bass, he's been around Roscoe, so he's, he's experimenting with sound. <laughs> Let's give up for the one, the only, Julius Paul, Julius Paul, yeah. And the drummer, like no other, let's give up for Isaiah Spencer, y'all, Isaiah Spencer on drums. So we want to thank you for coming out tonight, and we're going in the studio tomorrow to record this, so. This is a good opening kind of segue into recording the piece. And if anybody doesn't, doesn't know the way I write the piece, I, I leave room for interpretation in, in the pieces and expansion, you know, because one of these days we're going to play this stuff with the symphony. You dig what I'm saying? With the full regalia, I want dancers, <clears throat> but I don't want European dancers. I want European dancers, but I want African dancers. I want European dancers. I want singers. I want a choir, I want a gospel choir. I want the whole shebang with the stuff. I don't want no little stuff. And I want um, a VJ video, and I want live drawing of art so it can be in a, a total experience. So let's give it up for the band, y'all. Give it up for them, y'all. We're gonna call it the Live the Spirit 10 Tet. The Live the Spirit 10 Tet. <laughs> 